Well, it's my pleasure today to welcome you all here. Thank you for coming on what might be a worse weather by the time we leave. I don't know. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Baldwin this afternoon. Paul is well known to most of you since he's greeted at you by name. Uh, a longtime history teacher and principal of what used to be the Elgin County Board of Ed. I uh, also had a successful political career, councillor, mayor of Elmer, and in 2006 he was awarded in Elgin County. He's had a long interest in local history, particularly in architecture. And I've been very uh, lucky to have worked with him on two projects uh, concerning architects, one on John Finley and one on David Kilpatrick. And we have a couple of catalogs from those shows on the table over here, so if you're interested in that, please uh, help yourself to one. He's also working, I know, on another architect, perhaps better known to some of you, uh, whose name is um, uh, Neil Dara, and hopefully there might be a third exhibition from that. Uh, as he did with those two architects, uh, Paul will place today's subject, actually two subjects, a father and a son, uh, Tommy and James Riley, within the context of their times, and will account for their significance. He'll remind us of what they accomplished in their own time and why we should remember them today. Uh, we're very glad that he's here to speak to you. Will you please welcome Paul Baldwin. When we do history, we normally depend, decide upon a subject that we want to study, and then we start the rote research process. We go through books, we go through census and street records, we go through correspondence, if that's possible. If it's a public topic, we go through uh, newspapers. And what we're doing is we're trying to look and either um, justify the impression we have or enhance what we hope to add to the story in our narrative. And sometimes in that we find little nuggets, little nuggets, little ounces of history that really capture the essence of what the person is or what the topic is. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I did some work many years ago, like almost 60 years ago on Thomas Talbot. And I was going through correspondence in the uh, Library and Archives Canada, and I found some correspondence that Talbot had with the, the Lieutenant Governor Metcalf, Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. And the correspondence said um, that um, despite the cold winter, the hemp harvest was wonderful, the grass is unbelievable this year, and I'm going to survive the winter. I didn't know that Talbot smoked marijuana, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the essence is he, he must have. And not only did he, but did others, you know, because it was a cheap, I mean, means of getting through a cold winter. So that's like an ounce of history, okay? Another time I found correspondence between James Whitney and a, a, a St. Thomas lawyer whose name was Thomas Crothers. Crothers went on to become the Minister of Labor in the Borden government, and I think maybe the best Minister of Labor Canada has ever had. Because rather than just representing uh, manufacturers looking for labor, because he was from St. Thomas, and there was such a labor movement in St. Thomas, he actually represented labor as Minister of Labor. And in that, before he was elected to the federal house, uh, he did an investigation of the cost of textbooks because people were complaining that the public school system had to pay too much for textbooks. And he found there was collusion between the publishing companies in Toronto and that they had artificially pushed the price up. And he broadcast that in the newspaper to the embarrassment not only of the publishers, but of the government. And in this correspondence, there was a, a letter from Whitney that said, I'll tolerate that this time, but never speak out like that again. 
And so that's kind of an ounce of history, not only about the honesty of Thomas Crothers, but also about the political machinations that occur at the Ontario or any government level. Now, what, what I, I, I tell you that because those are things that historians find. By accident, I was found with the story that I'm going to tell you today. Because I was going through newspapers looking for information on football, rugby football in St. Thomas, when the story jumped out at me that I've got here, which I'll try and unclip, which I should have done beforehand, um, which is that the former St. Thomas man is interned, Thomas Riley in Leipzig. Boy, why would Thomas Riley, a name I recognize from the CBC, be mentioned in the St. Thomas Times Journal? So rather than just skimming as I was, you know, you skim through to find the information you want, I stopped and read it, and it said that he is the talented son of Captain James Riley, formerly of St. Thomas, and that he'd been interned by the Germans in Leipzig, and he was interned for the full duration of the Second World War. So that little gem jumped out and, and, and grabbed me and led me to read the story to investigate the Elmdale Harmonica Band and to then think, you know, this is such a story, it could, we should know about it. I've been doing local history for 60 years and I didn't know about it. I'd never heard of it. And it's something we should celebrate, both the pride that we have in Tommy Riley, because I didn't know he'd spent time in St. Thomas, and the appreciation we had for his father for what he did when he was in town. So that's the kind of what has led me to this story. And as I was saying to Sharon, you know, it's such a glorious story, it could be a movie. It's like, the music man that Eric Bunnell mentioned in his column, um, Mr. Holland's opus, if you know that, do you know that story about the band leader? Um, Hogan's Heroes, because of course Tommy spent five years in, in detention, and some kind of Greek epic where this man learns to play the harmonica with such skill that he becomes internationally renowned for his harmonica ability. So that's what the kind of story is about today. Um, it starts with James Riley. James Riley, um, Tommy's father, um, born in Glasgow, his, his grandson David tells me, um, went to Nelder Hall, which was the, the um, regimental music, I've got it, Royal Military, School of Music in England. Studied to be a bandmaster and in 1918, 1919 came to Guelph to become the bandmaster for the for the Guelph Wellington County 153rd Battalion. He was in Guelph for about seven years, um, maybe a little less than that, and he not only was the bandmaster there, but he was also uh, the leader of the OAC Symphony Orchestra. Mike said that might get a little bit of humor to think that OAC had a symphony orchestra, but, <laughs> but evidently it did. Um, he came with his wife, um, Helena, and two children, uh, uh, Tommy's older sister, Margaret, uh, his brother, James, and Tommy was born in August, I think the date was August the 8th, if I've got that right, um, in 1919. And so the family lived in Guelph, and he made his living as uh, the bandmaster uh, of Guelph and the, the regimental orchestra. For, I don't know why, in about 1927, 26, 27, he moved to London. He was in London for a while, now a family of three, okay, three children. And in 1928, he appears in the street directory as living in what, is, what was, in my time, although I see it's now closed, the Midtown Tavern. 
and the up. It was a. It was a. It was a um, boarding house, I think. And then in 1930, he bought the house at Six Glen Banner Street, which is adjacent to um, Elmdale Public School. He came because he had been uh, granted the position of bandmaster for the Elgin Regiment Band. And from what I understand, that not only went well, but that um, in 1929, with the crash and the depression, he had less finances than he expected, and he took a job as the custodian at Elmdale Public School. So here we have the regimental band, and I think James is to the side. And then he took a job at Elmdale Public School. And he was the custodian at Elmdale Public School. Now I want to pause for a second about Elmdale because really I had not paid much attention to the, the neighborhood of Elmdale. I mean, I ride through it, maybe to go to, and I'm a kid and I'm here, to go to Pinafore Park, or I drive through it to come to Parkside where I taught for, for five years, but I haven't given it much thought. Um, and I think it was even more impressed on me just last Sunday because I went for a walk throughout the whole neighborhood. And I realized that it's a modest neighborhood adjacent to St. Thomas by the bridge originally, developed by Dr. Wilson, J.H. Wilson, who became a senator, um, and that the anchors of, the visible anchors are the broom factory, which is behind the armories, you know, the big red brick building, Hayes Dana, whatever, that was originally a broom factory. And then the armory, then the Pierre Marquette Railway, and um, the cemetery. And so, well, the cemetery didn't hire that many people, I would imagine. The others were employers, particularly the PM, and, um, and that was the neighborhood that then he came to serve. And that's a good picture, Mike, thank you for that. the roundhouse, eh? and all of that. I, I forgot to mention the park house, too, now that I'm talking about houses. <laughs> the park house, how many know where the park house was? Uh, yes. Go on, Rod, put your hand up. I know you know, too. <laughs> uh, so the park house was the hotel that was associated and the beverage room with the, the, the Pierre Marquette and the c &O Railroad. Anyway, he, he got a job working as custodian. The principal of school was Hugo Dome, Jan and her cousin's grandfather. And between Hugo and James Riley, it was decided in, he says, December of 1930 that they would try and form a band. And so they worked with the Board of Education and the Mother's Club which uh, is perhaps the home and school, as I recall it, but support from the mothers of the pupils. And they raised $200 to buy harmonicas. So that was the start. And so he organized in April, he says, of 1931, a harmonica band. He told the students, the pupils, that he would um, take them to the C&E if they did well in the Elgin Music Festival. Now, St. Thomas and Elgin was very keen on music at this time. And partly that's through Elma College's influence. They had the Medlin choirs, they had the community, they had bands and, and choirs, and they competed at this Elgin Music Festival. And the kids did compete, and they did well, and therefore, uh, it was decided that they would take them to the CNE. So in August, late August, early September, they were taken to the CNE. Um, they did well, um, um, and I guess I'll get to that now. They went to the CNE. They had a, a mark of 93. There is a, 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 a detail in the, uh, in the Times Journal that explains that um, there were three top comp competing bands. I'm not sure if there were more, um, but um, that after the, the three top had played, the judges decided that the two other bands 
not Elmdale, should play again. And so the students felt dejected that they were competing then for first place. But after they played again, they learned that it was, they were competing for second and third place and that they were the successful band. And so they, there was a, a write-up that congratulated them and that the, uh, the, as it says, the unanimous opinion of the adjudicators was an ideal harmonica band because they played in harmony, in four-part harmony. So from April through to August, they learned to play the harmonica, they learned to play in four-part harmony, and he directed a band that was achieved a, a mark of 93. The, um, I want to read this little portion from, that I made a copy of from the, um, the Times Journal, because this is, I think, if you were to make a movie, would be one of the highlights of the movie. About 60 people went from St. Thomas altogether, many mothers taking the day off to accompany the boys and girls. Principal Doan was there in advance, having gone down to make arrangements about lunch, etc., and the organization of the trip was perfect. They left about 7.15 in the morning by the LMPS in a special car. A special bus took them over from, to the CPR depot in London, and on arriving in London about 1 o'clock, uh, when, on arriving at London about one o'clock on Wednesday morning, it was found that um, T.M. Jameson, the St. Thomas agent, had a bus waiting them there to take them back to the LMPS. So at 7.15 in the morning, they rally at the LMPS station on Talbot Street. They go across to London, they get on a bus, they go up Richmond Street, they catch the CPR, they go to Toronto and met by Hugo Doan, Hugo Doan most likely takes them to lunch. They go to the C&E, they compete, they think they've lost, they've won. They've given two or three hours at the C&E. They're gone bus back to the CPR station. They ride from the CPR station back to London. They take a bus from the CPR station in London back to the LMPS and they come home. What a day. <laughs> they would be absolutely thrilled they would be exhausted. Their parents would be so proud. That's when they went first and they got 93. Um, now I'm not sure where I am. I <laughs> should have to try me with the next picture. This is the picture of the successful band with the names. Um, uh, I won't go through the names, but I do have for anyone that was interested copies of the names of the people in the band and how many years they were in the band, okay? So this is in 31, Hugo Dome, James Riley, equal number of girls and boys, many of them in grade six, I would think, although I don't have records from the school board to prove that, Tommy Riley, the feature of the second part of the, my presentation, is there. Is that right? I thought Tommy Riley, I haven't looked at that, was the tall boy right in the middle, but I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. They're all there. Yeah, it, they're all there. Okay, in, that's in 31. He, he's, not, he's not fully satisfied that everything has been accomplished. And so 10 students from that, five girls and five boys, are selected for an accordion band. So he establishes in 31 an accordion band, and then, yeah, I put that in the wrong place. So that's the accordion band, and those are the members of the accordion band. All of Waite, Dorothy Page, Dorothy Russell, Minnie Moon, Edith Berry, Edward Sanders, Tommy Riley, um, I think there was a, a Bob Borage, I think his name was, Ken Lucas, and even Calvert. And, and, uh, and Miss Elliott was the accompanist. They all, again, they go through that year, they practice, they get better, they go to the CNE the next year. Both bands win first place in 32. Uh, the Times Journal reports just, I think, more on 
on the harmonica band at Elmdale's Harmonica Victory. And so they're greatly praised for what they do in, in 32. Um, they um, continue to play, continue to get better, and I think we're now at about 33. In 33, they go down again. There's no Toronto competition in 33. There's no competition in 33. Nobody else brings their band to take the field. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's because, you know, things in the Depression upset things majorly, or whether or not they just, like I used to feel when we played Arthur Bowden, I'm not going to win this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, in 33, they're granted a mark of, of 93. Wonderful performance, serious thought and preparation. The conductor evidently knows children as well as music. And I'll make a point on that, that it, it, these lists that I have prepared indicate not only his his dedication to music and his success as a conductor, but he, he must have had a personality that glued the kids to the band. Because the band in 31 was 30, in, in 32 was 40, and in 33 was 50. And I, I did make a note somewhere, I don't know where I put it, but it's here somewhere, that, that there were something like 20 pupils who were with him for that full, those full three years. So he must have had a way with them because you can imagine the amount of work that they're putting in to practice to meet his specification. Now he not only did that, and there's the 33-34 band, and you can see equal number of girls and boys, and the number of kids that he's trying to manage, and then he must have had their commitments, or else he wouldn't have been imagined. I wouldn't want to teach the class <laughs> with a vice principal outside the door that had that many kids. Um, at any rate, he not only did that, um, he also, along with the, the, the uh, Elgin Regiment Band and the Accordion Band, he established the Elgin Symphony Orchestra. So he had an Elgin County Adult Symphony Orchestra, and he had a boys' choir. And as his grandson said, he's just, he was absolutely dedicated to music, obviously also to the people of our community, that he would give this amount to them as the director. So um, he won, they won in 33, they were given this cup and told that the cup was theirs. Each member of the band was given a medal. And that's the Tommy Riley medal. Okay? How are we doing, Mike? A pamphlet was prepared in 33-34 that outlined um, the success of the band. On the front, you can see the 31 Melbourne Music Festival the CNE, the Elgin Music Festival, the CNE, the CNE for both um, the accordion band and the harmonica choir. In 33, the Elgin Music Festival, the CNE, uh, and in 34, without the CNE offering a competition, they, they were successful at the Elgin Music too. Um, and in that little booklet, James Riley wrote, and he said that the real merit of these wins is not that some 40 boys and girls play harmonica, accordion, or xylophone well, it is that these young people have got an introduction to music. They will not be satisfied with such homely instruments as they grow older, and I guess he was talking about the harmonica, uh, as they grow older and learn to appreciate good music, but they're already grounded in staff notation. They'll become pianists, violinists, and other instrumental players, adding to their own pleasure. I won't continue. But that's what he saw and what his vision was. And I'm sure that he imparted that to the students. Now, if you played an instrument in high school and you left high school and the instrument behind, 
you may not have picked up that instrument or a similar instrument again. You know, I stopped playing the piano when I went to high school because I wanted to play basketball, and I really didn't play the piano thereafter. You know, and that would be my grandchildren, <laughs> one played the violin, and one played the French horn, but once they could, didn't need to play it for, you know, a school credit, they stopped. And perhaps these students who didn't have harmonicas, I would assume that they were the school's harmonica, didn't play much of the harmonica thereafter. But they had, in this formative years, they'd had such a grounding of cooperating, of being conducted, of practicing, of doing well, that I'm sure that it had a, a lifelong impact upon them. And so, I'll come back to James Riley, but that's why I think he's really important in our community for what he gave. He was not only uh, appreciated now, but also appreciated at the time. And in 1934, at a Labor Day, at the ballpark, with Pinafore Park, when Mitch Hepburn was celebrating his victory of 1934, they had this free activity. And you'll see that the harmonica band, the regimental band, the bugle band, uh, were all featured, and James Riley would have been the conductor of all three. So he was certainly appreciated in the community. He was also appreciated in England by the Honer Harmonica Company, and they offered uh, um, to assist him in bringing the harmonica band to England to tour and to play in competitions. He broached the idea to the community it would have cost $6,000 a prohibited sum at that particular time. You know, we're talking most likely boats or whatever, I'm not sure, but. So he therefore had to look to a different future for himself. And so he decided that he would return to England, uh, take up the offer of the Honer Company and, and publicize, write music for, adjudicate harmonica band competitions in England. So in 1935, this is the editorial that we're going to lose, James Riley, and that it's likely that he will go back to the old country. And of course he did. And so, what's next, Mike? So he goes to England, not Dutter Margaret. Dutter Margaret marries a St. Thomas man and moves to Windsor. But James Riley, his wife Helena, James, the older brother next to his mom, and Tommy Riley, about 16 or 17 in that particular picture. He continues to play. I should have mentioned that his dad had encouraged him to take up his violin at an earlier stage. So he continues to be um, musical. And uh, I should also mention that his, <laughs> his dad uh, worked for the owner company and produced arrangements for the harmonica, such as that. Okay. But here's, here's um, uh, Tommy playing the violin in the, in the late 30s. And here's him playing the harmonica. It, it does say somewhere I read that he was on the professional stage. He was a professional harmonica player at 16. So he just, that became something that he concentrated on. However, he went to Leipzig in 1939 to study the violin. War broke out, he was detained by the Nazis, and he was uh, put in detention uh, for the duration of the war. So he was in detention late September 1939 until he was uh, rescued, released in May of 1945. And that became, and there he is there, the man in the middle. And that became formative for him because while he had the violin, and I wondered about that, but he did have the violin, he put more concentration on, um, on the harmonica. And he spent basically five years perfecting his technique on the harmonica. So he's released in 1945. He has a professional career as a harmonica player with a picture there, there, he tours internationally. He's recognized as the best harmonica player 
in the world, the Western world it is at that time, but in the world, okay? He also does scores for film. I'm gonna go on there. And there's the Tommy Ryder Concert Harmonica. A chromatic harmonica, which I'm not sure what that is, but maybe I'll learn today. Okay? In 82, he comes back to Canada. He plays at the TSO. He plays in Quebec City. He plays in Winnipeg. So uh, while he's on that trip, he comes to St. Thomas to visit friends and see sights. Um, and there he is in front of Six Glen Banner with his friend Lolly Marshall. And many of you will know Lolly Marshall. So there he is at the house that they lived in right adjacent to the school with Lolly Marshall. He continues um, and not only on, on stage uh, with symphony orchestras and doing all sorts of music, obviously to earn a living, but also on radio and television. And he has such an impact on music education in Great Britain and the British Isles, the UK, that he's in, in 92, is it? 1992, I have to get the right date. 92, 1992, he's awarded the member of the British Empire. And so there's the boy from Elmdale with his harmonica and the award from the British Empire, okay? Now, he was, uh, Tommy died in, in, in um, to get the right date here so I'm not wrong, in uh, uh, September 25th of 2000. But in celebration of his achievements, in 2019, the National Public Radio had a broadcast celebrating his birth. And we have that copy, and Mike's going to play that. That is a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach, originally written. But really is the only way to describe Tommy Riley. That is a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach, originally written for the flute, but it's played on the harmonica by Tommy Riley, who was born a hundred years ago today. Classical music commentator Miles Hoffman has this appreciation. Tommy Riley could do pretty much anything on the harmonica. He could play fast, flashy, technical passages with ease, and in lyrical music, he could melt your heart with his beautiful sound. When you get to know Tommy Riley's playing, it's not hard to understand why some 30 different composers wrote concert pieces for him. Riley also recorded countless film scores and pop arrangements, and he played pieces by such famous classical composers as Zetor Villalobos, Ray Fong Williams, and Igor Stravinsky. Stravinsky, in fact, once said to Riley, after hearing your interpretation of my chanson russe, I would be happy to let you play anything of mine. Stravinsky's Chanson Russe, or Russian song, played on the harmonica by Tommy Riley. Riley's first instrument was actually the violin, which he began playing at the age of eight. And even after he became a professional harmonica player, his musical idol was the great violinist Yasha Heifetz. Riley said that Heifetz was his model for interpretation and musical phrasing. I think it's also pretty clear that Heifetz was his model for musical fireworks. <laughs> famous violin show piece. Yasha Heifetz used to wow audiences with it all over the world. The Tsegoyner Vise, Gypsy Birds by Pablo de Sarasate. They might wonder, how does somebody become a harmonica virtuoso? 
I mean, Riley's case, unfortunately, the Gestapo had something to do with it. Riley was born in Ontario, but his family moved to England in 1935. He had started playing the harmonica back in Canada when he was 11, and by the time he was a teenager, he was already a seasoned public performer on that instrument. But Riley decided to go to Leipzig, Germany, to continue his studies on the violin. And it was in Leipzig in 1939 that he was arrested by the Gestapo. He spent all of World War II as a prisoner of war, and it's time in the prison camps that allowed Riley to spend hour after hour practicing the harmonica and turning himself into a great player. That's Tommy Riley playing a portion of one of the many pieces written specifically for him, the Concerto for Harmonica and Orchestra by British composer Michael Spivakovsky. Tommy Riley died in the year 2000 at the age of 81. He spent his career determined, as one critic wrote, to establish the highbrow credentials of the harmonica, and he certainly succeeded. For NPR News, I'm Miles Hoffman. Miles Hoffman is founder and violist of the American Chamber Players and also the distinguished visiting professor of chamber music at the Schwab School of Music in Columbus, Georgia. Oh, okay, here we are. Because I want to come back from Tommy and what he was able to accomplish back to James. So this is James and Helena in later life. James had worked uh, for the um, Honer Company until 1955. Um, although I understand that during the war, he spent quite a bit of time in Ontario, maybe in St. Thomas, I don't know, in Windsor, certainly with his daughter. Um, and there he is at work in the UK, or at least at his desk at work in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and there he is again, bandmaster. So uh, I want to just pull together, do you know that Mary Sanders wrote a book, St. Thomas is Proud Out? And um, really, we didn't know about the harmonica man. We didn't know about James Riley. But along with all those people that she celebrated, I think you could certainly celebrate Tommy Riley. Because while it doesn't say, it says he was born in Guelph, which is true, in Ontario. But really, the formative years he spent here. And uh, he has accomplished unbelievable heights in music. And I, and I want to stress an appreciation. I mean, we're proud of James Riley, but we're even more appreciative of James Riley. As I say, he's like the music man that came to town, that did so much to promote music, not only of the generation of the military band and the symphony orchestra, but particularly as the custodian of Elmdale Public School. And so, I think that ends what I would have to say about that. But before, um, uh, we're not finished, so don't just get up and run away. Because <laughs> at this point, I'd like to introduce um, a man who's come down to be with us today from uh, the other side of Toronto, Tommy Riley's grandson, Tommy Riley's son, James Riley's grandson, Mr. David Riley. David? Maybe it was that. 
but he liked to travel back and forth between Canada and England, man, and England. And Helena would say, you know, I'm fed up now, let's go back to Canada. And she'd go back again. So I used to see them like every so often, so they were a bit of a distance. But Grand O'Reilly was a very funny, dry character, sense of humor. He, um, he spent a lot of time obviously going back and forth to London, so I spent most of my time with my grandmother. And it was quite strange because you were talking about uh, Nella Hall, the you know, Royal Military School of Music, and that's where they met. That's where they, she went to a concert there. It was a, a young girl in Twickenham, which is their famous rugby ground in Britain, if you, anybody, you know, you know the union, rugby union. And um, every time when we lived in Twickenham, this little house that we had in Twickenham, they lived with us for a while, which was <laughs> quite strange, a little two bedroom house, but five of us in it. And um, every Saturday, my grandmother used to take me up the road to the Salvation Army Hall, where they had the Salvation Army bands. And they were big bands in those days. They weren't like five piece or six piece. These were like 40 piece bands in these little halls. And every Saturday we'd go up there and listen because it reminded her of Nella Hall, obviously, and when she met and have tea and biscuits and listen to these bands going it with everything. And it was a it was interesting because at the time my dad was actually about to play the very first time I think concerto ever written for broadcast, which was one of the Milkowski's, which you've mentioned. And he was trying to rehearse in this house with all these people and, and all the relations that lived in the area coming and going, and he was going crazy because it was a difficult piece for the first time, it was a live broadcast. And um, it was quite interesting because a few years before, and I think I mentioned this again to Paul, my grandfather had said to my father, because my father was totally self-taught. He was in the band, but he was never taught by my grandfather, not ever. He taught himself because he wasn't in the band to begin with. And he was so annoyed that he taught himself to be in the band. <laughs> and absolutely true. He went to his father and said, I can play the harmonica. He said, yeah, yeah, sure, we know. Stick the violin. No, I want to play the harmonica. And that's what he did. He showed his father he could play. He went to his friends like Laurie and that and learnt bits and pieces from them and learnt to play. And that's how he got into the band. So I think the whole thing was when they sort of he got older and at 16 he was travelling around London doing concerts. Hope we don't mind telling this. No, no, no. <laughs> they just I mean I'm writing his biography at the moment, so I'm up to here with letters and information and things I never knew about. Sometimes I wish I didn't know about. But, but at the time he learnt with his father, he, his father said to him, you know, I can't teach you anything anymore. You know, far more than me. Right. He was writing tutors and that, and he said, Dad, you should write a tutor about the harmony. And they did write one together eventually, wrote a tutor together. But he said, there's no good me, you, I can't teach you anything, we just got it. And he, he said about the prison camp years, which was interesting, and knowing, you know, my dad obviously growing up, because this thing is my life too, obviously it will be, it's, it's, you know, he's gone, but it still is my life. And um, he was a, he was such a person with no ego, Amazing dry sense of humour. Almost he loved anything comic as possible. He loved you know audiences that were rough, orchestras that played badly. Where his he just loved it so much he would laugh and laugh. He used to play the takes and things like this all the time. And we were <laughs> we were so we were very close because I used to in later years when I was a composer too and I used to conduct for him and I wrote for him and he would play on film sessions with me for stuff I did and that and it was a great friendship. And I remember once being in New York, and this probably sums our relationship up that we were talking about. I was in New York working uh, at a, for MCA, they recorded for MCA, and CBC said, why don't you do an interview? We've just done one with your dad in Toronto. Why don't you do one while you're in New York about him? He's done it to talk about you. So we did this interview, and it was, you know, why should you get a solo? He plays classical music, you know, rock and roll and all this. How do you get a solo? So it's very simple. I said, we are like brothers. I said, that's fantastic. He said, yeah, but he's the younger one. <laughs> <laughs> and that was so true, because he was, he was just, he had such a terrible sense of humor. He used to play practical jokes. My mother used to juggle, because going back to the war, I'm sorry to go, but it's, it all comes out when I'm talking about what he was like. During the war, when he, he did study violin, he went to study by, uh, violin in Leipzig, and he used to say, well, I'm, I was good, but I'm no Yasha Heifetz. I don't think you'll have to worry. And what he was actually doing, though, was in 1935, when he went to Britain, 1937, he went to Europe to play with a, a circus act. That's him. He just loved all this kind of thing. He was like 19. And he told his dad, I'm going to Europe, and I'm with this circus act, and they're jugglers and acrobats, and they do cabaret and all that. And my grandfather said to him, what? 
He said, well, you know, I want to see Europe. I want to see Europe. I want to get out there. And, and his, his, his father says, well, Europe, you know, dicey. The father is not so comfortable. And I said, no, I've got to go. So he went. He spoke with this band called the Four Phillips, this outfit. And they took all over Germany, everywhere, Italy, San Marino, they did all these massive shows. He even was the back of a, a, um, a circus horse at one time, he got stuck horse. He said he lost about four pounds, four or five, fifty pounds on this occasion he went. But anyway, he, he went to do this. And then when he went, they went to play in Leipzig, during the day, he would go to the conservatory to study the violin. And that's when he sort of, this is when, as you said, he was arrested. And there was a very interesting thing about him. He told me this wonderful story. I don't know when he told my mother this story. He told me this wonderful story. He was going out one night. He'd had a blind date fixed up for him by one of the girls in the thing with a ballerina from the German National Ballet. And um, he was you know, getting himself all spruced up for this. Came down in his hotel room, gave the key to the concierge behind the desk, and the concierge went like this. The Gestapo came across and arrested him. Oh, wow. That's what actually happened in that story. And the strange thing was <laughs> that 15 years later in Karlsruhe, when he was performing in Karlsruhe, a woman came to the stage door and she said, we never met. And it was the same ballerina. <laughs> and they sat and talked about what their lives might have been like if they'd actually met. She was married with his and dad was married and what he had me. And it was a really, he, he told me the story was quite, you know, emotional thing about it because it was a, a, that day when he was looking forward to meeting a new girlfriend, he was interned. Yeah. And uh, he, had, he remembered the war, he never used to talk about it, all the stories I heard from the war, and a lot of people do, I'm sure you all have relations and you've had parents and that know about it. They don't talk about it very much, you hear about their stories from other people. And that's what I used to get for stories from different people. But I won't go on because I will uh, go on and you'll be going on tomorrow morning. Um, they were both great men. Both of them were, were lovely musicians. My grandfather was just lived for music. No matter, didn't want it, no matter what instrument it was. It didn't really, really worry him. He just loved music. He loved teaching music, probably to do with the army as well. He taught a lot of young people at Nella Hall, because he was bandmaster there eventually. And he, he, was just so full of fun. And I used to spend, when I got to know him a little bit, because he died in 1956, and I was, tell you how old I am now, I'm nine, I was nine, I think, nine or 10 in 56 when he died. And um, my mother nursed him through very bad cancer he had. And he was still smiled and still had such a lot of stuff. He always talked about music, and Dad and him used to sit down and talk all the time about stuff they'd done together and what Dad had achieved, and he was so proud. And I wish he'd obviously been alive, and Dad got his MBE from the Queen. Um, it was, there were two men who were very similar. They were very strong in their characters. They didn't take to people that easily. My father had a great expression. He used to say, when he was asked to work with people, no matter who they were, he used to say, are they nice people? <laughs> if they weren't, or he found out they weren't, it didn't matter how much money, how much that people would never work with them, ever. And that was the thing that I hold in my heart about him, that he was such an honest man, um, honest about his work, he had no ego, he was just a great, great character as a father. And as I said, lots of fun. We used to travel all over the continent. I used to drive for him and we'd have to laugh endlessly, he'd get chocolates till he looked like them. And used to wait till I went to sleep in the car and go behind the seat and eat the whole box before we'd even I'd woken up. <laughs> but he was that kind, he was a little boy, he had a lot of boyish characters and the harmonic was his absolute life, it was meant everything to him. And when he was very ill, just before he died, he was in hospital. I, I always remember this scene, because it's a very sad scene for me. You know in hospitals you often are given these little things, panels on the cable which you can push buttons on, and the nurse supposedly will come and whatever. And he had one of these, and the strange thing, it was at the shape of a harmonica. And he would never let it go, he wouldn't let it out of his hand in hospital. He wasn't really together until he did it. And it was my wife who said to me, he wants his harmonica. And we went home and brought back his harmonica. Because in those, in, by that time, he had solid silver harmonicas that he actually created and developed himself. Because James Galway, the flute player, said to him, come on, Tommy, you can't play these cheap old wooden instruments anymore. You need something like me. I've got a golden flute. You need something, you know, something impressive. Silver was the best thing. And Honus wouldn't make one. They said, no, I'm not going to make one. So he said, I'll make it myself. So he did. He made the very first silver harmonica. There's only one in existence. Made in England, the Hindu silver. I have it, of course. And it's in the bank.
Um, <laughs> but it is a fantastic instrument, and then they started making some harmonicas. But I don't know, it, it's that strange thing. We took him that harmonica, and he held it. He couldn't play it. When his playing started to go, he was such an honest man. Somebody said to him, you know what, Tom, give us, you know, he said, I don't play anymore. Because the standard of playing as a musician that he had, a, had taught himself to was such a high standard that he said, I will not go out and embarrass myself by saying, oh yeah, I was the greatest. And I think you probably know the name Larry Adler, who was the, was the well-known harmonica player just be before that. He was kicked out of America. Um, because he was part of the McCarthy thing. He was a big star in Britain and what have you. Dad and him, so there was a rivalry early on. Dad found out how to get work because Larry was there. And when Dad died, Larry wrote, he said, many players tried to copy me or Tommy. He said, but, he said, Tommy was unique, a one-off. He said, I will miss his wonderful play. He didn't even have a close second. <laughs> anyway, I hope I haven't taken too much of <laughs> University and was songwriting for I think it was a famous band of you. Who any of you know the secret? We did <laughs> Georgie Girl and all that lot of songs. I was writing songs with them when I was 16, and that was my first thing in record producing. And, that. and my dad introduced me to them. He was the best manager, sort of he never was, but he was the best manager I could ever have had. Anybody came along, as you met my son, I used to go, oh, <laughs> and I got very friendly with Judith Durham, who was the singer of the Seekers, and I wrote tons of stuff for her and for them, and then went on to produce different artists and arrangements. I taught, my dad would never teach me music, ever. No, I'm not doing it. So I had to teach myself to arrange and write and do all that kind of stuff. And then finally, once it made me very proud when I was conducting the BBC Concert Orchestra for it, we did a series of shows on the BBC. And uh, I said, God, I've been conducting you. I said, I've had you on recording sessions and that for a long time, but not with a concert orchestra, Robert said. <laughs> and he said, oh, you'll be fine. He said, all the musicians in this app that you play with every day on sessions. He said, anything goes wrong, they'll put it right. And they would have done, because they were a great bunch. And he said afterwards, and when he was interviewed by somebody, he said, I played with my son conducting. He said, he said, I couldn't talk about the tempos. He took no notice on me. Like it was a great broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> It's how he influenced me, really. He supported me 100%. He was fantastic. Anyway, anybody else want to ask me anything? Yeah. Now, what, what is that? What is that? John brought a harmonica that he... I'm right here. I introduce. Yeah. Several years ago, Holger Peterson, CBC Edmonton, okay. had a harmonica evening. And he wanted to know who played the harmonica from the farthest distance from Edmonton. And I called in and I said, I'm calling from the shores of Lake Erie, south of Sparta, and I won the harmonica. <laughs> Peterson, this is sent to Don Durkee. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Not turkey. Durkee. Durkee. No, no, not they, Durkee. They would, no, I'm just kidding you. I, I know, know it's, 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 it's attention of John Hardy, R1 Sparta, Ontario. That's right. From Holder. And look at the year. Look at the date. Where is it? Oh, it's uh, the January the 9th, uh, 2016. And so I want it. Because I came from the farthest distance from Edmonton. <laughs> Is that what you played for them too? Yes, you'd have to prove that. No, I got that from them. No, but did, did you play something to prove that you could play the harmonica? No. no. <laughs> I just had the answer is still this <laughs> Okay. I have a, do I have Peter? Do you have a question? I do. I'm just wondering when your father was, would it be considered liberated at the end of the war? 
Uh, yeah, there was a, I, I think I was telling Paul, there was a battle between the Scots Guards and the Panzer Division of the German Army over the prison camp. And the prisoners were all hiding in, I've got, actually I do have a photo, I should have given you these, of hit them hiding in shell holes created by the battle, the tank battle that went on between the two armies. And the poor prisoners, they were actually, Dad eventually, because he was a, because he was a, um, a civilian prisoner, he wasn't a, obviously a fighting man, all the camps were full of musicians from all over Europe, all the different things, that's why they had bands everywhere, and all the, in the orchestras. Uh, but they, he ended up in the, the Royal Naval Camp in, um, in the Ludeburg Heath, so they ended up. And uh, that was the final, they said they were going to be released, the Germans left, and left a small company with them and said, day after tomorrow you can all walk out. But while they were all packing their stuff up, and Dad was getting all his gear together, the Panzer Division turned up in the prison camp and set all the tanks up all around the huts and started firing at the Scottish Scots guns. So that, that's what he was liberated from. And as I told Paul, it was a funny thing. He had his violin and he went right through the wall. The Germans never took it from him. And he was very lucky that he had a, um, a camp, I don't know what you call it, liaison officer, who was a German Canadian. And Dad couldn't get new harmonics because the wooden bodies are on because one can show to another the bin. Because the wood swells and the plates swell and then you can't play it again. Well, that's the reason he prays it's not on But in the camp, he exchanged, because he, he had this Canadian, he exchanged coffee, a pound of coffee, which was like gold dust in Germany, for harmonicas to be sent from Hona Harmonicas in Trossing, who made the harmonica. The only people who made harmonicas there. And Ernst Tone, who was a big friend of Dad's, was also on Adolf Hitler's hit list, because he was very empty there. Parceled up these 20 harmonicas and shipped them out to the prison camp, not for Dad because he couldn't get it, to the, this, this um, liaison officer, German liaison officer, who then gave it to Dad for a pound of coffee. And that's, that's how he got this coffee because it's, uh, the many people don't know, Hona harmonicas refinanced Mercedes Benz after the war. People don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, so that's, that's when he was repacking. He came back to Britain, but the, the violin was quite interesting because he came back to Britain, they never took the violin from him. When he got back to Britain, some British bloke had stolen it. <laughs> some British soldier had stolen it. It was taken off and put in the hold home. When he got to Britain, Croydon, they landed in. He went to get his violin and got it. And he said, I will never play violin again. They said, I did see him once with an orchestra when a violinist, the first violin of an orchestra was playing something. He said, It's not like that. It's not like that. He said, How is it then? He said, Dad took his violin and played it. So I've seen him, I've, the stories that I can tell you, which I didn't tell you, but there are some very funny ones. Anyway, yeah, that's, that was re repatriation right at the end. They're one of the last camps liberated because of this, this um, battle going on between the Germans and the Scots Guard. I was curious because I know at that time with the Russians coming in mm. and the Russians getting to Berlin first, yeah. how far ahead the camp was where your father it was, was being kept. It was North Germany, just below Hamburg, it's the, the big heat of it. So they were quite a way away from them. And that's why they thought they'd get out quick, because the Swiss had come in and, and done all the stuff they had to do to repatriate them. But they were, as I said, they were ready to go when the Germans showed up again with another gang of tanks and just sat in the prison camp. And was it the Scots Guard that... Yep, yeah, the Scots Guards that actually got them out. There's a, there were a lot of people, they crowded, there's a camp for 6,000 people, I think, and in the end, there were 18,000 men at the camp. Um, you know, various, but all, apart from a few musicians, of course, they get everywhere, don't they? Um, but apart from a few musicians, uh, there was Dan and a couple of other, I think, left in the end. Uh, the rest were all Royal Navy and some merchant men at the camp. And did you just say that the Swiss were brought in to help? The Swiss were the ones who, because the Red Cross people. came in and, and organized the release of prisoners in some of the camps. Yeah, they negotiated with the Germans who would go when, when they, the Germans would leave and would come in and check the, what was going on in the camps. Um, and uh, as my dad always said, he used to tell me, he said, I tried to get out of it, he said, I escaped three times and was caught three times. So, which he was. Um, and there was one funny story about a musician. In one camp, he, um, there was a man in a camp in Slin in Poland who was, had uh, hypothermia, he was dying in the camp, there had no fires properly or anything like that. And so they used to take the wooden slats from their beds and burn them. So they had like three slats left to keep a mattress on because they couldn't sleep on them. They over Dad had a list of things like overcoats and pajamas, they wore them all at once. And being an idiot that he was, he used to say at the time, he decided he wanted to help this man. So at night, when it was all quiet, he went out and cut off 
four bottom steps of a guard tower. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell me this story, the person in the couple of bottom steps. So when the guards came out of that, they fell the last four steps and got injured. And of course he was taken into the commandant. He said, you know, Riley, I can shoot you for this. And my dad thought, well, I've had it now. It's the end of the story. He said, but I do not want to deprive the world of such a wonderful achievement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there you go. Thank you very much. Pleasure. We have other questions. Oh, in the back. Are you ready to write your book like your father? Yeah, I'm just about completing it now, but that's why I'm verbally, <laughs> because it's all, in, you know, all going around in my head. But yeah, I'm doing it, I'm doing a book. It's sort of, most of it, it started out as what was going to be a copy table with a photograph, because he was a, a mad photographer. He used to have a pipe, his harmonica, and his camera. They were the three things that were always with it. And um, he, he just, we decided we'd do that. But in writing the book, as I said to you at the start, because his life is my life. There was so much emotional stuff. It was very difficult to write it, actually, to begin with, um, because he, he couldn't get work, couldn't do anything. In the very early days in Britain, after the war, she said, not before the war, because he used to travel around London before the war, the 60s. I was in fact on a bus. I just remember this story. And a bus once gone somewhere. He asked the conductor on this London bus where he was going, where he could get to this something at the Empire uh, Theatre to play. And the fellows gave him the directions. And he walked back down the bus. He said, you know, kid, he said, you should stop doing that. He said, you're watching far too American, many American movies because he had a Canadian accent. <laughs> 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 he didn't in the end. He had like a soft West Country accent in the end. It was quite strange. It softened down. But, so, yeah. So, sorry. Did he ever tell you why he didn't get out of Germany in the first place? Yes. It's uh, his For family. For all of the abuse? Or? Yes. The idiocy of you, I think he said. He didn't, he couldn't understand all the stuff that was going on. He, he used to talk about, you know, how the Jews were being treated, and no, he didn't. He just, I don't understand all this, I don't get it. And his father said to him, come on, Tommy, you should leave and come home. No, it'll be all right, it'll be okay. I'll, I'll be fine, you know. I'm, uh, uh, and he used to travel around Germany in this big Mercedes they had to, they used to, the, the family had, you know, with a, a trailer on the back with all the equipment in for juggling. And he, he used to break my mother's uh, pots and pans because he could juggle, it was fantastic. He used to juggle the pots and pans and plates and used to break them. And he got pans and that. Um, and he could throw Indian clubs and I mean he was just he was nuts. But I mean that was really what it was all about. But he he could have got out of Germany, he could have got back. Um, and uh, he just decided he'd chance his arm, as they say, and stayed. And a very sad another sad thing was when he was in Leipzig, he was arrested with a pianist friend, and they were putting him to police station. And uh, in that police station where there were 90 Polish Jews. And he went to bed one night, but up the next morning they were all gone. Mm. Just the two of them were left in the police station. Bed. And he, he always remembered that story. And uh, he certainly made me, as you know, talking about things like made me think about you know, world history and what had gone on and what was going on. And, I mean, I'm no, I'm no spring chicken now, so obviously I think about those things, you know, over the years that you've gone on. But he was. He was all round, like my granddad. I didn't know my granddad that well. I had, I had moments with him when he was very funny, and he was always, because he'd gone by the time I was nine. Um, but my dad was another whole kettle of fish, and he was, he was a fantastic father, I've got to say. He was a great, great man, great musician, and a very good person. So, thank you. Oh, somebody, sorry. You can't shut me up, can you? <laughs> so, thanks, Walter, because it's just so interesting. But what I'm wondering is, I don't know if either of you can answer, what happened to harmonica bands? Like, what, it seems like such a brilliant concept. Well, they've, that, gone, they've moved to the Far East. What's that? <laughs> they've moved to the Far East. I mean, if you go to China and Japan, Dad used to have a place in Britain called Hammondswood, which he bought for teaching harmonica players. And he said he couldn't believe how bad the standard was to stop doing it. So he, in the end, took a, decided to take pupils from the Far East because they were really good. And if you go to China, there's several million harmonica players in China. And bands, ensembles of various sorts of all play his work. And he was always looked at as, they look at him as being a god in, in Japan and China because of, and he never went, never went there. He, by the time it was all rolling along, the Japanese government even paid for one of their great players, a girl, actually, Shima, who came over, they paid for a year to study with my dad and housing and food and everything. Financed her for a year to come and study. She was a world harmonica champion until I think he taught her. 
Um, and she's still, she's gone back to play now, so to the end of the day. But he, he loved teaching people, he liked, he liked the friendship of it. He didn't like the, the boasting about the harmonic players, I mean, he hated that, so I didn't bother with a lot of it. But he loved teaching, and he was a great teacher. He was a really good teacher, and a nice man to, to teach with. And my mother, they, they spent all their money feeding people. <laughs> they'd come and stay, and then they'd say, how much is the lesson, Mr. Ryan? He'd say, five quid. Well, the local piano teacher charged 20. He was the best player in the world. He said, oh, no, I can't charge him a lot of money. They haven't got a lot of money. One fellow came once to have a lesson. Dad went out and looked at his car and said, Jimmy, look at your tires. Oh, I can't afford them, Tom. He said, there's money. Go and buy them, he Mm. And that's the sort of person that's why I say to you, he was such a nice man. Um, and uh, if I can be half as nice as he was, I've done something right. Anybody else? I have a question for you. Is there anyone here? I know Jan and Cousins. Cousins? Cousin. Uh, uh, are are the, uh, uh, the grandchild of Hugo Dome, who was the principal of Elmdale Public School. And that would have been at that time, that would have been crucial to the development of the band. Mm -hmm. You've got to get money from the board and all of that. Um, is there anyone here whose father or grandfather, like, is Mr. McCormick here? Because Andy McCormick, who some of you would know from the community, uh, was with Community Living, uh, ran the workshop. He was in the band. But do any of you have grandparents who were in the band? You do. And what was his name? Charles Gowdy. Oh, really? And my uncle. Are, are you Kathy? Yeah. Oh, hi, Kathy. We <laughs> chatted. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, there were three Gowdies. Kathy, Jack, and Charles. Is that, is that right? There were five. No, but in the band? Two in the band. Oh, two. Jack and Charles. Okay, there is actually in the listing another one that appears. So I'll, I'll give you that list so that you sure, can yeah. follow that. Anyone else? I wish I knew Lolly Marshall somewhat. I wish I had talked about well, to Lolly Marshall about that. But his his sister wanted to be here, but had the back door. Okay. Her husband came in too. Do you know what her, his name was, Mike? Did, did yes, I made it up. Okay. Uh, so I wonder whether or not because there were three Marshalls in the band, and uh, Sue Escott is here. And um, uh, her brother's uh, father, there's a, uh, there was a death in there, um, yeah, who's Ed uh, Thurston. He was in the band, too. Um, so there's a whole listing here. And if you'd like to get a copy, I've gotten a few copies of this. So um, before I, I close, I want to offer some credits to this movie um, <laughs> and to uh, thank people. Um, I come down, I do research here, I stay at 18 Roseberry where I was treated like a prince. And so I thank the host from 18 Roseberry, Sharon, uh, for all that you do while I'm down here. Um, I was, I'm also treated as a prince uh, when I go to the public library. It's a wonderful place. It's just a wonderful place. And I sometimes have trouble with the machine that I have to work. Uh, and they're very helpful. And so I don't know if anyone is here from there, but I, I would want to throw out my thanks to them as well. I want to thank David for coming down. It's very good of you to do that. And I want to thank Brian, and I want to thank Mike. Because uh, when I suggested that this was a story worth telling, Mike was oh so helpful, oh so supportive. Um, I can't work that. I can not even turn off my phone. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not good at that. I'm just not that very good. Um, at any rate, um, it, and Mike will retire in a month. And a new, the new museum curator is here today. Um, and he's been here for 16, 16 years. And uh, I don't remember that I was on the the hiring committee when you were hired, but I was on county council, and it was a wonderful hire that we made to make you, and so I thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing uh, and saying hello and goodbye to people. Um, it's been a great turnout, and uh, I was very thrilled to learn about it, 
And I kind of take it that you were too. So thanks.